I never really fit in during high school. I wasn't a complete socially inept outcast, but I definitely didn't have a clique or a niche to hang around with. I didn't have a reputation, which luckily means I wasn't the quiet kid either. I had friends, I had bullies, and I would occasionally crack jokes in class. Unfortunately, they were always rude jokes about whatever a teacher was teaching us at the time. So, this resulted in me getting scolded and disliked a lot, which made me a prime target for suspensions and detentions. And this is how my story starts. I don't know what sarcastic comment that I said, but lo and behold, it resulted in me getting an out-of-school suspension for a day. The thing about out-of-school suspensions is that those are probably some of the best yet worst punishments. I get the day off, but it normally resulted in 12 to 14 hours of constant belittling from my parents. Why can't you just shut up and sleep in class like the other kids? Or, I work until my back is sore to put food on this table just for you to screw off in class and blah blah blah. You know, the standard stuff. So I hatched a plan right after I was given my suspension. I would unplug the phone line early in the morning because no one ever made calls so no one would even notice the phone hadn't rung all day. Then I would just go for a walk around town and maybe explore the woods that were semi nearby. I could easily waste a day away in the woods, and the weather seemed fitting for a hike. And thus, that's exactly what I thought would happen. I mean, yes, I did unplug the phone line. My parents were rather old school with technology, and this was back in 2010, so they weren't huge into cell phones at the time. And yes, I did act like I went to school and then walked off into town. But when it came to going into the woods, I was not prepared. I walked out of the gas station with an energy drink that I had bought with some leftover allowance and headed towards this trail that leads into the wooded area of town. It was rather beautiful, as it was just beginning to become springtime so leaves were beginning to sprout out of branches, flower buds were popping out of dirt, and the sun felt amazing. I hopped off the trail and walked for, assumingly, miles into the woods. I really couldn't tell how long I had walked for or how far I had really traveled, but I was definitely nowhere near civilization. Eventually, I came across a small little opening in the woods. Hills seemed to convex into this area and trees seemed to stay clear of it. In reality's sake, it was probably some complex root system that prevented more trees from growing, but it still was pretty cool to see. Pretty cool to see until my eyes stumbled upon this old rusted freezer that sat near the middle of the clearing. I began to wonder if this was a man-made clearing, but didn't look like any trees were chopped down. Curiosity took its course and I walked up to it, and sure enough, it literally was just some rusted box freezer that you'd find in a garage or basement or something. I started inspecting it before finding this flexible metal hose with a large bolt hanging down at the bottom of it, laying in front of the freezer. Before I could even process it, My brain starts imagining that this bolt could have been used to murder someone or something dark and intrusive. I usually can just shake these thoughts off, but this one in particular rattled me and I felt myself getting scared. Scared, I thought? From a rusty box? Are you kidding me? And so, I pretty much bullied myself into opening the freezer, with a stick that I picked up, of course, since the lock wasn't actually securing the freezer's lid. My heart was beating so fast that I thought my chest was going to burst, and I looked inside the freezer. Blood. There was blood everywhere. Blood, entrails, organs, guts, a whole box completely full of gore and rotting meat. I don't even give myself time to close it. I dropped everything and raced right out of there. I kept looking behind to see if someone was giving chase because my brain kept telling me that I was being watched, but no one was behind me. At this point, my thoughts are so full of, you walked upon a murder scene, you're going to be next, and this is all part of their plan. But no, nothing. I ran through the trees, tripped over rocks, scuffed my knees on rocks, and kept racing. I made it out of the woods and onto the trail, where luckily no one was around to see me, because I didn't have a plan. What do I even say? Hello, strangers going for a walk. I'm a dumb teenager who should be in school, well, Technically, I should be at home, being absolutely screamed at, but instead, I pulled a huge bluff and now I'm running away from a murderer. By the way, there's a freezer of gore in the middle of the woods, just as a heads up. I start speed walking back to town, where I'm fortunate enough to see some buses driving around, meaning I can get back home, 
blend in with the other students and act like I'm just getting home from school. But this whole time I can't stop thinking about the freezer, or about why someone would just dump so much gore into a freezer and then abandon it. Did they want it to get found? Like a sick little game to them? It began plaguing my thoughts until maybe two days later. See, while I was fighting these thoughts, contemplating whether or not I should report it, I was also supposed to be at home, being suspended from school, being lectured by my parents for my classroom behavior, and the only way the school will know that I got lectured is from a signed paper from my parents. So imagine the look on their faces, on all of our faces, when one evening, we're all making dinner, my mom walks in with a letter from the school saying that they need to verify that they're aware of my suspension. Well, needless to say, I was screamed at for the rest of that week and into the weekend. I wanted to get around the 12-hour hissy fit just to end up receiving several days of it, an unsettling trauma for months. I'm still afraid to go hiking to this day. I know everyone wants to hear creepy, paranormal stories about witches and skinwalkers, but this story that I have is the only creepy life story that I have, and it still keeps me up late on some nights. I'm currently employed as a receptionist from my town's local pharmacy and wellness center. In other words, it's basically the place for people to try and steal cough medicine or give us false prescriptions. It happens much more often than you imagine, but that's irrelevant to the story. Now I work the early morning shift with my hours being from 5am to 10am because I live pretty close nearby. I spend most of my shifts taking calls, leaving voice messages, doing paperwork, again usually just me faxing doctors to get proof of their signature. Since it's so early in the morning, a common routine that I face is that I eventually have nothing more to do in terms of work. This means that it's time to head back to the break room and pass some time. I used to make up tasks and chores to do to keep myself busy until I caught my manager sleeping behind his desk. That was my cue to not take this job that seriously. In the break room, there is this tiny little TV that is mounted on the wall, but it has no place to sit and the TV only gets the news and some vintage fitness channel. So I put some water on to boil to make some tea, lean against the wall and begin watching the news. Now I'm not alone in the building. The janitor had gone upstairs a few minutes before I went into the break room and the resident's kid's psychiatrist was in his office on the first floor. All of a sudden, I hear the bell that's near the front door ring. This indicates that someone is here and is meant to let the receptionist know someone's on the premises if the receptionist isn't at the front desk. I take the water off and head back to the front desk. As I leave the break room down the hall, there's this door that connects the waiting room with the hallway that leads to all of the offices. To get past this door and to get where I'm at, you'd need either a key or a punch combination to enter. Suddenly, I watch as the doorknob begins to rattle violently, like someone's trying desperately to get in. I take a different route away from this hallway and walk in from another door behind the front desk. There, I see this gaunt, pale old man trying for the life of him to get the door open, constantly twisting and tugging at the doorknob. He stops, looks at me and seems to just freeze in place. I begin to think that he might have just had that oh shoot moment of being caught, but his face has this remorseful look to it, like either dread or sadness. Now, quick little detail, I'm a guy but I have decently long hair and I shave my face regularly and I guess if you squint, I do kind of look like a woman, at least in my facial area. The guy seems mystified as he stares at me. Claire? Claire? He coos out to me. It takes me a moment before I snap back to my customer representation voice. Uh, sir, I, I'm not Claire and I'm going to need you to sit down, please. If you have an appointment, you'll have to wait for the doctor to call you in, okay? As I told him this, he looked at me with this sad, almost puppy-eyed expression. It honestly felt like I just told him heartbreaking news and I started to wonder if I said it too harshly. Claire? He mumbled out before miserably shuffling to the front door. He turned one last time and gave me another sad, soul-shattered look. Don't 
Leave me. And then I just watched through the windows as he stumbled away and vanished into the morning. No idea if the guy was having a dementia episode or was on something, but it honestly haunts me sometimes. I know it's not anything terribly terrifying, but I can't stop thinking about who he thought I was. Perhaps a partner who had passed away. I just can't seem to get his raspy voice out of my head. I worked as a local hiking guide for my county's forest preservation organization. It has benefited me in so many ways. I've gotten in shape from hiking, i felt more connected to nature, and it's been a blessing towards my mental health. I used to just be another factory grub. Nothing wrong with working in a factory if that's what you like or enjoy, but I used to be in a place that made me feel immensely replaceable. I wasn't a name, just a badge number. If anything were to happen to me, my badge number would just be pinned to a new guy and no one would remember me. So to go from that mindset, to be able to live as a forest guide, has truly improved my life in ways I never would have imagined. The only problem is that the forest is uncontrollable. What happens in nature is only to be experienced and never interrupted. Animals behave in strange ways, sometimes uncanny and disturbing ways. For example, one morning I was guiding a small family around the trails. We have to stick to the trails that have been cleared, otherwise it could result in endangerment and missing person reports that could hurt our publicity. As for the family, it was a husband, a wife, and their little daughter who couldn't have been more than six years old. And for the trail itself, they chose a beginner trail to go through, and it really is a pleasant experience. No, you don't get to climb over any crazy rocks or anything, but the way the sun pours through the leaves, it's hard not to be impressed with nature. I've guided a lot of people on this trail, and it still sometimes astonishes me with how beautiful it truly is. The kid had been asking me all sorts of questions about animals nearby, as she had taken a liking towards the birds that were around. Even her mom was egging her on to ask more, and I could tell that the mom was losing herself into nature. So I began to tell them all about the local bird species, what time certain species come out, what weather other species enjoy, and I mentioned about the great horned owl. This animal instantly has the daughter jolted with excitement, so I specifically start talking about the owl. As we continue, the trail comes to a bend in the path with a sharp turn downhill. Since I'm in front, I'm the first to notice that a large tree had fallen down near the path. It didn't block the path, but with all the commotion it must have caused, I noticed that a nest in its branches had fallen onto the path. I tell the family to wait there as I get closer to inspect the nest, and that's when I first noticed that it might be an owl nest. I don't normally get too involved with other people's interest in wildlife, but I couldn't help but point out the owl nest to the mother and daughter. The daughter made this audible wow, and right then, that's when I noticed something else. This owl nest wasn't just made out of miscellaneous straw and sticks. There seemed to be almost a bed of animal skulls inside it, nestled between some sticks. I don't mean there were a handful. I mean there seemed to be a literal bedding layer made entirely out of skulls and bones from small animals. I couldn't identify them since my job didn't really have me involved in vulture culture type stuff, but if I were to guess, it was a combination of mice, rats, and possum skulls. There was one skull in there that stood out from the rest though, but as I said before, I couldn't identify it. But the skull was much larger than the others in comparison, and so after talking about it to some hunter buddies and other guides, I've come to the rough conclusion that the skull must have belonged to either a fox or a coyote. I've seen a lot of things happen in the forest. I've had to calmly rush Taurus off trail after finding two deer mating. If you don't know, bucks get extremely territorial when in heat, so if we're spotted, we would have been in great danger. I've even had a fox kill a rabbit right in front of a group of students before. But this, I can't say I've seen a bed of skulls before. I know I stared for too long into the nest because the father asked if everything was alright. I somewhat gasped, recomposed myself, and grabbed the branches and put them far off trail. I told them that everything was fine and we continued with the hike, but on the way back, I noticed that the branches I set aside were suddenly missing. It's probable that some collector came by and noticed the gold mine that I set aside. 
but I really couldn't stop thinking about how eerie that truly was. I grew up in a small town south of Detroit. Most of the people in my family are or were employed at a factory, machine shop, or assembly plant in the area. Around here, it's common to hear a lot of stories about people getting killed or maimed by machinery or some other hazard at the workplace. As my father used to put it, things at the plants were a lot different before those a-holes at OSHA came in and changed everything. After hearing a few stories myself, I never understood why Dad thought OSHA was a bad thing. I myself, I was just a humble security guard at one of these places. The plant that I used to work at was a foundry back in the 1950s, up until it was shut down and converted into a warehouse at some point in the 1980s. For those of you that don't know what a foundry is, it's a factory where steel gets casted into different forms. My story starts in 2006 when I got hired by a contracted security company. I was assigned to a midnight shift at this place. Some of the older people there used to tell me that the place was built on top of a county-owned graveyard. I've never confirmed this, but I'm pretty sure that it's just an old man trying to scare the younger guys. Interestingly enough, the place I worked at was the first factory in the country where a person was killed by an automated machine. We had to do a patrol round through the basement of this place. The first time I went down there, it was just as I imagined. Dirty, dusty and lots and lots of junk and spare parts, and best of all, nice and dark. While you were down there, you couldn't get a cell phone signal and our handheld radios got a spotty signal at best. And what I think was an effort to save energy, they had installed motion-activated lights that would stay on for about 20 minutes before turning off and would turn on when you were within 7 or 8 feet of walking. So one night in the summer of 2006, I was doing my rounds down there, there was one area where for some reason or another the automatic lights wouldn't turn on. As part of the round, you had to walk straight through this area, so I always carried a flashlight for that occasion. I was about halfway through my round when I had to walk through this dark area when I saw the shadow of what appeared to be the outline of a man walk out about 12 feet or so in front of me. He had walked behind a support column and then just disappeared. I thought to myself about how strange that was and continued on my way thinking that it could have been someone else down there messing with me. I had to go back down there the next night and this time something felt different. There was a strange stir in the air and I hate to admit it but it felt as if though I was being followed. Whatever this feeling was I couldn't shake it. I make my way back to the area where I'd seen the shadow the night before and this time no shadow man. I made my way into an area that was like a big hallway and of course it was dark and I wasn't close enough to activate the lights. I stood there for a second looking into the darkness when about halfway down the hall a light came on, then another, and another. So me with my flashlight standing ready to swing at whatever was coming down the hall towards me felt a slight cold breeze. The real strange thing was that my coworkers were having similar experiences of seeing shadows and feeling cold gusts of air in places where you shouldn't. I ended up working there for way too long and in that time I saw the shadow man several more times and felt the cold breeze a lot too. I've since moved on from that place but I do have a lot more creepy stories about it and other experiences that I've had. But I do wonder sometimes if these things that I saw were just tricks of the light or people that meet their end and are still on the job. Now in the fall of 2007, I decided that I had done enough research into the paranormal and it was time I got out into the field and do some serious work. I had done some looking around and I had gotten in touch with a local paranormal group that was kind enough to take the time to give me a trial run of sorts. We met up at a restaurant and had discussed the finer points of what the night's festivities were going to be the investigation of a local cemetery that was reported to be extremely active. The place had an interesting history. Supposedly, it was the resting place of a witch that had been hung sometime around 1870, no doubt by angry townsfolk with pitchforks and torches, and the entire family that owned the land was buried there as well. At this point, I had already read enough and experimented with trying to record EVPs with little to no success, and I also had a digital camcorder that I had played around with a little bit. 
It was after dark when we finally found the old cemetery. We all stayed pretty close together and decided it was time to leave when we found a protest truck at around 11 p.m. We all stood around it wondering, one, what is a truck like this doing parked in the back of a cemetery? And two, go figure, go out looking for ghosts and find this thing. Well, about the time we started walking away from the truck, we saw a man wearing dark blue mechanics coveralls walking to the truck and getting in. The truck had a camper in the back of it. Well, after the too-close-for-comfort run-in with Michael Myers look-alike, we left and all met back up at the parking lot of the restaurant we'd met at earlier. We said our goodbyes and called it a night. We were out there for about two hours or so, and I had about 90 minutes of video to go through and about 30 minutes of audio recordings to listen to the next day. I never got anything on the EVP, but the video was interesting. About 20 minutes or so in, I was holding my camera and I had two people walking in front of me, they were about 15 feet ahead of me. In the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you could see the outline of a shadow run out from behind a headstone. It ran up behind the person that was in front of me and then vanished. This shadow object couldn't have been but two, maybe two and a half feet tall, and for some reason, I always thought it was the image of a little girl. I never went back to that place, and since that time, I've lost contact with those people. I think I may have actually gotten something on camera... I can't be too sure about it, but I can tell you this, everyone I've ever shown that video to sees the shadow run out from behind the headstone and everyone that's seen it gets just a little bit creeped out by it. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. If you've ever been walking out in the woods in Ozark country, and thought that you saw a big hairy monster, you might have. Don't laugh, many people have seen the blue man. Other parts of the world have their own real or maybe mythological monster. Scotland has Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Yeti or Abominable Snowman from Tibet. The United States has a few creatures of its own. From the western states come Bigfoot legends, the Iceman from Minnesota, and the Headless Horseman as told by Washington Irving. Ozarkers have never been ones to be outdone by others. Here in the Ozarks, we have the Blue Man of Spring Creek. The story began over a hundred years ago in the winter of 1865 when a hunter from Douglas County, Sol Collins, was hunting out on the ridge between Big North Fork and Spring Creek. With snow on the ground, Collins was tracking a game when he came upon a set of tracks that were something like a bear's. Sol had killed many bears, but these tracks were the largest and widest that he'd ever seen. Quickly, he followed the tracks and kept on them. He had followed the footprints north, almost to Indian Creek, then in a wide half-circle to the west until he was close to above the Big North Fork River. When climbing the north slope of Upper Twin Mountain, Collins looked up and barely escaped being hit by a boulder that tumbled by him. He again barely escaped two more huge boulders that crashed down the hill. Just as he stumbled to get behind a big oak, he first saw the gigantic figure shaped like a huge man, which was naked except for what looked like the skin of an animal around its midsection and other wrappings around its feet. The creature was completely covered with a coat of curly short black fur. When the sun struck it, it took on a deep dark blue hue. Collins never gave up his claim that this creature was not less than nine feet tall and this is among the shortest estimates of many others in the years to come. Sol stated that he only stared long enough to see the creature throw away a ten-foot club that he was carrying and pick up another boulder which he threw against the post oak. Then the giant made an ear-splitting scream that some said was more terrifying than any that had ever come from a beast that could be found in the hills. Collins then headed back and gathered up some of his neighbors and for a few days they kept on the trail of the beast the best they could by following its tracks in snow. A few times they caught a glimpse of it at a distance, plundering through the woods at a rate that left the posse far behind. No man was ever able to get within distance to take a shot at the creature, but nevertheless, the hunt continued for another two or three weeks almost every day, but there were never any results. Many people saw the wild man, and people in isolated cabins claimed to be awakened in the dead of night by the screams of the creature. 
Usually after the awful shrieks were heard, the person would find a lamb or pig had been carried away. By now, the blue man, as he was now called, had been considered a fake and it was almost nine years before he was heard from again. In autumn of 1874, word was passed that he had emerged again because sheep and hogs had started disappearing and the carcasses found in the woods. Organized hunts were carried out to capture the creature, but after a week or two, the blue man disappeared once again. Sixteen years went by and he only made two or three visits to the hills along the Big North Fork. Every visit he was seen and hunted by many. Every visit he also made a clean getaway from the hillsmen. However, the last time they got too close, for he remained out of sight from 1890 to 1911, and nothing was seen or heard of him. For this reason, many of the people who had moved into the area regarded the stories of the Blue Man of Spring Creek as a figment of someone's imagination. About this time, he was seen again, and more joined in the search. Reportedly, they discovered the creature's den in the cave in a remote valley. The floor of the cave was littered with bones of animals he had eaten, and a bed of dry leaves was found in the corner, again, just as before the creature disappeared. The next time the blue man was seen, O.C. Collins was searching for two lambs that had disappeared. He spotted the creature on Spring Creek four miles from Old Horton. Two days later, Cap Turner came across him, catching fish with his hands in Indian Creek. The creature chased Turner up the steep hillside. Cal Alsop, a few days later, was one of the posse that had chased the blue man into a cave. He stumbled through the darkness over objects he knew were the pelts of sheep or the dried hides that had once made a meal for the wild man. He was seen one more time after eluding his pursuers at the cave. That time was at Ava Crossing, where he was catching crayfish from under rocks and eating the tails. By November 15, 1924, terror was prevailing over Northern Howell and Douglas counties. From Tater Hill to Collins Ford and from Blue Buck to Ava Crossing, people were searching for the blue man. Cattle weren't allowed to graze, sheep were watched by herders with rifles, and livestock was locked up at night. Nobody left their home and churches and schools were closed. People armed with rifles and shotguns searched every nook and cranny of the area in search of the Blue Man of Spring Creek. December of 1938 was when the next account of the Blue Man came. The Bunt brothers, who were living in Johnson Hollow, said their coon dogs had bayed off from them quite a little distance. The men had been seeing range hogs in the area quite often so they didn't go to their cabin for their guns. They just went up to the ridge to call off the dogs before they killed one of the hogs. They got quite a surprise when they saw the dogs baying up the big tree in which there was a man hissing and snarling in anger. He had no weapons and no clothes except for some type of fur garment around his middle and something wrapped around his feet. According to the brothers, he was hairy and apparently blue from the cold. The younger brother took the dogs a good way off while the older tried to talk to the man in the tree. Bunt promised him food, shoes, clothing, and a place to sleep, but the man in the tree just stared at him. After about half an hour, Bunt gave up and joined his younger brother. They said that they were hesitant to walk away and leave the man there, yet they had no reason to question him further. Later, they were questioned as to why they didn't report this to the law, and they said that they had no complaint against the man and had no way to come the eight miles into town. Only once was a wild man caught but it happened before the Bunt brothers had their confrontation with the Blue Man. The August 18, 1911 edition of The Sentinel, published at Pomona, ran a story entitled Wild Man Captured. The mysterious disappearance of livestock and farm trucks that had had many farmers along Bryant Creek puzzled. Two boys, Ott Collin and Tom Rayburn, were returning from a fishing trip. They noticed something apparently springing right out of the ground, near the base of the hollow, and began chasing one of the frightened sheep that was grazing there. The frightened boys didn't stick around. They ran home just as quick as they got there. When they got back home and told their parents what they had seen, they quickly gathered a bunch of men. The boys acted as guides, and when arriving at the spot, they found a log and an opening in the ground that looked as if it was frequently used. One of the men pulled together his courage, shoved a lantern in, and followed it into a cave room of considerable size. At the far side, a man was crouched. 
and said to be the sorriest specimen of a man any of them had ever seen. He was bare of clothing except for a breech cloth of some kind of animal hide. His body was completely covered with short hair and his head was covered with a mass of hair two feet long. The wild man tried to get away but he was caught and turned over to the authorities. He either couldn't or wouldn't talk and his cave was littered deep with wool, hair, bones and feathers. There was no evidence of him ever having cooked his food. The most recent account of an encounter with a wild man occurred in 1966 in Peter Bottom, a fertile meadow along the War Eagle River, near War Eagle Community in northwest Arkansas. It began when a doctor who was wanted for murder found refuge in the forest around Peter Bottom. When the man was caught, he was ruled insane and sent to a state mental institution, and just before he died in early 1960s, he made the statement that since he was near dying, he wanted to tell the story of a monster that lived in Peter Bottom. He also made the statement to stay away from the area, and the story appeared on the back pages of local newspapers. But because of his history of mental disorder, it was treated as a figment of his imagination. Little interest was stirred in the War Eagle area until 1966. On a Sunday afternoon, two men were horseback riding down the steep road that leads to Peter Bottom. Suddenly, a tractor coming at full speed from the bottom almost ran them off the road. The man on the tractor warned the two that there was something horrible living down there. He had been starting his spring plowing when he spotted the monster. The boys thanked him for his warning but decided that they wouldn't believe it unless they saw it for themselves. They kept riding but the horses became restless and soon refused to go any further. The boys then walked the rest of the way into the valley where they spotted what they thought was a large clump of white fur on the grass near a cedar tree. They thought it must be a dead horse or cow, but when they got within ten yards of the clump of fur, it stood up. The two young men described it as an animal that stood upright like a man, with its body covered completely with white hair about two or three inches long. They said its height was eight or nine feet, and its features looked more like a man's than an ape's. Its face and hands were pinkish color, and these were the only areas not covered by the white fur. They also said that there was a strong offensive odor which they described as smelling like old coffee grounds coming from the creature. The two stood there unable to believe what they were seeing. Then the creature began slowly walking toward them making strange sounds and they turned and ran as quick as they could. When they got to their horses they put a quick distance between them and Peter Bottom. The parents of one young man said by the time he reached his home in the Knob Hill community he was almost in a state of shock. He then spent several days in the hospital with a nervous disorder. As the young men's tale spread, hunting parties were formed, but the strange creature was never seen again. Over the years, cattle have been found, torn apart, and one man's corpse was found with his limbs separated from his body. No one can prove that the two really saw the creature, but Peter Bottom hasn't been farmed since then. It can be said that the albino monster in Peter Bottom is clearly unique in its own right. How then can the legend of the Blue Man of Spring Creek and the monster in Peter Bottom be explained? This has come to be the most widely accepted reasoning. Jerry Hilterbrand, who settled in what is now Douglas County in 1820 and died there in 1885, told the following story handed down to him by the older residents of the area. Years before the American Revolution, while Missouri was still a part of the French colony of Louisiana, a French fur trader came through the Ozarks with a beautiful Spanish woman. After a while, he got tired of his companion and traded her to an Indian chief for a larger amount of furs, leaving her captive. The woman, left with the Indians in the wilderness, lost her reasoning and lived for years as a demented person of the hills. From her came a race of people, half Spanish and half Indian, who never mingled with anyone and hid away in remote and inaccessible places. There they increased in numbers and were known to exist for a good many years. Between 1820 and 1840, when the pioneer settlers came to the Ozarks, the race probably disappeared and many thought that it probably retreated to the more remote Boston Mountains in western Arkansas. The world's oceans are vast, enigmatic places full of countless mysteries and strange sights. Yet the mysterious secrets of the sea are not confined solely to what we can see, but rather also what we can hear. 
Far from the stoic, silent, underwater world we may imagine, the acoustics of the ocean are in fact awash with a constant cacophony of seismic activity. Boats, sonar, marine creatures, cracking icebergs, undersea volcanoes, and many others. While many of these sounds have definite, known, or mundane sources, there are others that have long managed to elude any sort of easy explanation. These are the eerie, unexplained sounds that pervade our planet's oceans, standing out from all others as oddities that continue to defy simple answers. Many of the mysterious audio anomalies of the ocean came to the attention of scientists with the help of a network of underwater microphones called hydrophones, which were set up in the 1960s by the U.S. Navy for the purpose of monitoring the movements of Soviet submarines. This network was called the Sound Surveillance System, or the SOSUS, and was sprawled out along the ocean floor throughout various regions around the globe. The microphones were typically located on the seabed deep below the surface in a place known as the Deep Sound Channel, a place where sound can travel thousands of kilometers due to the effects of the unique pressure and temperature gradient inherent to the zone which effectively funnels sounds without any interference across vast distances. For years, the SOSUS system was used exclusively to listen in on the audio signatures of submarines and track their locations, and the various other potential scientific applications for such an extensive network of deep-sea hydrophones were never really explored. It was not until the end of the Cold War that the network's primary purpose became obsolete and the system of hydrophones was allowed to be accessed by civilian scientists. By analyzing the audio signatures of incoming sounds as they arrive at different microphones, scientists were finally able to locate and analyze a whole new domain of acoustics, and also one of mystery. What they heard down there in the depths was often able to be fairly quickly identified due to each sound's unique sound signature, but the scientists also realized that many of the sounds were not so readily categorized. These mysterious notes of the deep come in a myriad of different types, some are low frequency and others high, some short bursts and others long continuous wails, and some happen only once while others can go on for years. The one thing they all have in common is that nobody really knows where they come from. One of the strangest of these enigmatic sounds is the one known as upsweep. The sound was first detected in 1991 emanating from across the entire Pacific, Besides this vast range, Upsweep showed a bizarre and totally unprecedented sound signature the likes of which no one had ever heard before in decades of listening in on ocean sounds. Upsweep consists of persistent, ongoing, narrow-band upsweeping noises that last for several seconds each. To the ears, the sound itself is described as sounding like the wail of an ambulance or the undulating howl of some huge beast. In addition to its haunting audio signature, Upsweep exhibits some other rather unusual characteristics that add to its mystique. The impressive geographical range of the sound makes it difficult to attribute to any one localized source. Upsweep is additionally very consistent and uniform in nature, which is unlike the sounds produced by underwater volcanoes or earthquakes. The sound is also highly seasonal, always peaking every spring and autumn for no discernible reason. Furthermore, it has demonstrated remarkable longevity, occurring at peak volume continuously from 1991 to 1994, and even after that reverberating through the ocean at a lower intensity. The sound is seasonably audible even now, and no one is quite sure what it is. One of the first ideas was that upsweep was caused by whales, but this theory was quickly abandoned as the volume was simply too high for any known whales to generate, and also did not move around from season to season like the song of migrating whales should have done. The sound also was much too uniform to be attributed to whales whose songs are typically highly varied in their range, pitch, and amplitude. Seismic explanations were considered as well, but the uniformity and constant nature of upsweep did not fit in with what is typically heard for these events. It was also suggested that the sound could be caused by simple water movements and currents producing a noise something akin to that of wind. Presently, it is thought that perhaps the sound is caused by the oscillation of some liquid as it reacts to coming in contact with lava, and one team of researchers think that they have identified the origin of the sound as being in the southern Pacific in the vicinity of volcanic activity. 
yet the sound still does not conform to the known sound signatures of such events. Despite these various theories, the origin of upsweep remains a mystery. Another bizarre mystery sound is referred to as slowdown and was first detected in the equatorial Pacific Ocean on May 19, 1997. It had been heard several times a year since in both the Atlantic and the Pacific and has been picked up on hydrophones nearly 5,000 kilometers or 3,100 miles apart. Slowdown is so named for its unusual characteristic of slowing down gradually over the course of seven minutes. It has been described as sounding like an airplane going by. Slowdown has typically occurred too far from the SOS US hydrophones to get a good fix on the exact point of origin, but one thing that has remained consistent is that it always comes from the south. This has led to the speculation that it is perhaps emanating from the Antarctic. It was thought that the sound could perhaps be the result of military exercises using some new technology, but the Navy has denied any such activity in the area and maintains the sounds are not man-made. One theory for the sound has been the noises created by the friction created by icebergs grinding against each other, the ocean floor, or even land to come to a halt, which would account for the slowing characteristic and eventual sudden stop of the sound. Additionally, the sound signature of slowdown has been shown to be somewhat similar to that of icebergs scraping together. At the moment, the exact source of the sound remains unknown. The movement of ice has been used to explain away other anomalous sounds as well. One of the weirder sounds picked up on hydrophone arrays is one called Julia. The odd sound was detected in the equatorial Pacific on March 1st, 1999, and sounds like a person cooing or whining. It has been speculated that it is most likely the result of a massive iceberg ponderously rubbing against the seafloor. Likewise, yet another sound known as train had been theorized to be that of an iceberg scraping against the seabed. Train sounds just like its name implies, like a distant train going with its wheels clattering along the tracks. Other noises had been chalked up to not ice, but even fire. A common explanation for a variety of weird ocean noises is the eruption of undersea volcanoes. One example is the sound known as whistle. Picked up in July 1997, the sound resembles that of a kettle of boiling water. It is thought that it is perhaps caused by an erupting submarine volcano. However, since the sound was only detected once and on only a single hydrophone, its origin may forever be a mystery. Besides the explanations of ice movement, volcanoes, and earthquakes, there has from time to time been speculation that these mysterious undersea sounds are caused by some sort of unknown sea creature. Perhaps one of the most well-known and baffling anomalous ocean sounds is known as the bloop. Recorded off the southern coast of South America by hydrophones nearly 4,800 kilometers or 3,000 miles apart, the sound is highly unusual in that it matches several of the common features found in sounds made by biological organisms, such as the rapid variation in frequency common in marine creatures. There is much debate as to what actually produced the noise, with a phenomenon caused by shearing and fracturing ice called an ice quake being suggested as a more rational explanation, yet several biologists have stood by the theory that it was bellowed by some living organism. It is a romantic notion to be sure that some undiscovered monster of the deep is out there, but since the bloop was heard over such vast distances, it would have to either be something far larger than any known sea creature, or be something extremely efficient at producing sound. If it is something so large, then what sort of leviathan can we expect to find lurking in the murky dark? Whether it was made by a natural phenomenon or a terrifying monster, whatever the case may be, the bloop has still not been satisfactorily explained. So what do we make of these anomalous ocean noises? Are they originating from a known source? Are they produced by some new undersea phenomenon we are not yet aware of? Or are these the sounds made by gargantuan mysterious sea creatures hidden within their remote layers? For now, we do not know. We know so little about the deepest recesses of the oceans. We are far from cataloging all the species that call these places home, and we still have an incomplete knowledge of the various natural phenomenon that go on here. 
We know so little that sometimes it seems as if we have two parallel yet distinct worlds existing side by side on the same planet, the world we are familiar with and the alien, little understood realm of the deep blue cold of our oceans. It often feels that our oceans might as well be another faraway planet. The sea is a noisy place, but this noise is not without meaning. Scientists plan to continue to monitor the hydrophones in the hopes that they will help to uncover some of the ocean's secrets. These listening stations could give us valuable insights into the geological processes raging deep below the waves, as well as important information on the movement and nature of the ice of our poles. It is thought that such information could even help to monitor the process of our ever rapidly growing climate problems, just as we are gaining an understanding of these various phenomena Perhaps one day we will be closer to the answers we seek with regards to the mysterious, unexplained sounds of the deep sea as well. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there's some super fun live streams on Sunday, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit at r slash let's read official and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, Omle du, fromage.